about our old friend C.S. Lewis, or do you? Let's talk about it with Dr. Jason Baxter on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. We're so glad you're here and... Uh, as always, you have a seat at our table. Incidentally, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here. Matthew wonders how certain beverages can be considered fully mature at 12 years, but his kids aren't even close. <laughs> If you writes these lines, uh, and I'll show you, Matt. Oh, that you're and, welcome. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Matthew is presently probably embroiled with some problems with kids. I want to encourage you, Matthew. That yes. will continue until they're at least forty years of age. <laughs> okay, and then it gets better. Forty-three. <laughs> oh, Our producer Jinx is in his little glass booth. And if loving Cracker Barrel is wrong, Jinx doesn't want to be right. <laughs> and our video director and one-man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. John says that all the world's a program and all the men and women are merely users. That's kind of scary, man. Matthew. Huh? Shakespeare? Yeah. No? Matthew, you, no. You should have gone with that room. directory. Tough and, room. Yeah. And then Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. And yet again, and we're all sad and in mourning about it, he's been passed over for a Supreme Court nomination. And <laughs> I'm so sorry, George. Had a problem with eth ethnicity and gender. <laughs> we can yeah, go to Cracker Barrel if you want to. Kathy White is the soft feminine side of the program. We promoted this before, but be sure and look for Kathy's C.S. Lewis inspired cookbook. Oh, uh, the glory of weight. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. That's uh, so bad. Oh, where did Matthew. Cracker Barrel come from? Oh, Matthew. I'm just hungry. I want the 12 year. <laughs> you give me the 12 year and you can have the Cracker Barrel and the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest oh, today is gosh. going to be fun, Dr. Jason Baxter. He's an author, a speaker, and he serves as Associate Professor of Fine Arts and Humanities at Wyoming Catholic College. Um, he wanted them to name him as a professor of medieval and Renaissance literature, but they refused, and he stuck with it. And since he gets his paycheck from them, he will accept their title for what he does. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Notre Dame. Jason writes on the relevance of medieval thought, literature, and art, and has authored five books. His latest is called, which I hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, How Great Books Shaped a Great Mind. Jason, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Even if this is a little rowdier than I'm used to. <laughs> oh, baby. It is. You're teaching college and this is rowdier? <laughs> we are decent and in order. Well, you guys are pretty order. rowdy. I'm kind of nervous. All right. I'm I'm in order. <laughs> Listen, we, uh, we talked about Lewis a lot on this program. Doug Gresham, his stepson, is a friend of ours. And when he's in the country lives in Malta, he stops by the studio and we sit down and talk. So you're talking to people that don't have to be sold on C.S. Lewis. Uh, his writings have been effective in all of our lives, uh, which shouldn't surprise you. But when you pick up a book like yours, all of a sudden I'm going into a world where I haven't traveled very much. Hmm. Now, I am an old guy, 
old as dirt. So I don't like change. And uh, I maybe wouldn't be, be a Neanderthal, but everybody I know thinks that I do. I don't like pop culture. I'm not on Facebook. I don't like Twitter. And and I'm irritated about being old, so it takes very little to irritate me. So I like your book. I really do. Thanks. You, you, um, you're opening a world. Why does it make any difference that we know about the medieval mind of Lewis? I mean, read Lewis. Be glad. Why do I care where he got some of this? Yeah, I, well, I think... I guess you could say that by knowing where Lewis gets some of his ideas, you can be introduced to Lewis's circle of friends, right? I mean, yeah. you go and everyone, you know, everyone who loves Lewis loves learning at least about the Inklings, right? Uh, yeah. uh, Barfield, the unusually weird Charles Williams, but his brilliant, you know, his brilliant friend Owen Barfield and Tolkien. So I think that's one of the fascinating things about Lewis is that he didn't want to do what he accused modernity of doing chronological snobbery mm. that is having a low opinion of something uh, just because it was old and and analogously to gk chesterton lewis you know thinks of the sort of practicing of what they both call the democracy of the dead as as chesterton puts it why should just the people who be walking around have the only votes possible and I think that's a very, you know, I think that's kind of a conservative sentiment in the best possible way of, of, of a sense of fidelity toward the past, but also a, a sense of um, a sense of our obligation toward the future. I think that that would be a kind of a robust conservatism, a robust Christianity in which we sort of take it in sort of multi-generational and not just the people who happen to be alive today. I think Lewis would be excited about that. We uh, we live in a culture that's pretty much severed that, uh, you know, it's true. We're tearing down our statues and renaming our buildings. And if you have written anything before the fifties, they don't want to hear about it. Uh, that's tragic, isn't it? I think so. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, this is how I, I put it. And I think Lewis would be very comfortable with this sentiment. Um, I say, imagine that there are 17 truths and, not, you know, one or two. We live in a world of sort of a trending world, right? In which we're allowed to have one correct opinion per year. And our, <laughs> our social media corporate overlords tell us dutifully what it is. And, you know, they tweet, they tweet it to us every single day. And then, you know, at the end of the year, Time Magazine says, this was the cause of the year. Well, if it really was a cause, first of all, I don't think we could necessarily address it all the way down to the roots in a single year. But what I'm more concerned about is, is you know, what if, a, you know, a rich and full life involves not one thing at a time, but really 17 virtues simultaneously? If that's the situation, then we, we need to have some reverence for our ancestors, not a, not a blind, idiotic fidelity in which we think that they possessed the totality of truth simultaneously, right? But in which they had one, two, three, four, five things which have dropped off our sort of cultural radar of virtues that we should we should continue to cultivate. I think Lewis would be very comfortable with that. And he loves to use these kinds of medieval metaphors. If you listen to medieval music, it's, it's what they call polyphonic. It's multiple melodic strands simultaneously in the same thing. Right. It's complicated. It's not like our, our sort of <laughs> you mentioned your dislike of pop culture. It's, it's not like our single melodic cells, which, you know, poundingly repeat themselves again and again. It's it's complicated. And I think they thought of the moral and the intellectual life as also involving that kind of complicated aspect. And I think that's at least one reason why we should pay attention to lose his own love of the of the Middle Ages. I sense among some of the young people that I know um, um, that they've hit a wall and they know it. It uh, is a, a pool of meaninglessness, nihilism, uh, questions without answers, and the suicide rate goes up. Are you finding as you teach students that uh, you're connecting with them, that they are going, wow, I never thought of that. Or do they dismiss you as a scholar who doesn't understand what's really going on? 
I think I am particularly blessed to teach the students that I do teach. I mean, they are already inclined. I mean, these these kids are basically want to be persuaded. They they want depth. But I, I, I but I think in my speaking engagements, when I even when I talk to the sort of typical iGen or Gen Z kid, when you talk to them about the one thing that they're afraid of, lack of depth. For a brief moment, they all put down their phones and sit on the edge of their seats. And um, these kids want to be deep. They want to be the sort of person that their friends go to and ask for advice. They want to have wisdom. They want to have deep loves. And so I think as soon as you can begin kind of bringing that out, and I think you you see their eyes change. You see the relationship change toward the past. They hunger for it. I think that's the one thing the gospel is written on the heart. It's not out of style. Mm. Oh, man. I, uh, I'm not a one who throws rock at, rocks at post-modernity. I, I kind of feel that we're coming into an age uh, that uh, was the age when Jesus was incarnated. And questions are beginning to bubble up that we never asked before. And for the first time in a long time, there's kind of a level playing field. That doesn't mean I promote postmodernity, but I but there's some good things, and we'll talk about them on the other side of the break. Jason Baxter, Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis. Don't go away. We're coming back. you're with us and you're going to think some new thoughts during this program and you're going to rise up and call our guest jason baxter blessed uh, for the book that he wrote by the way the name of the book is medieval mind of c.s lewis and i thought i knew everything about c.s lewis there was to know about c.s lewis And I've been reading this book, and I'm learning all kinds of new stuff. The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis. Get it and read it, and you'll be glad, especially if you're a Lewis fan. uh, You'll be glad for Jason and the fact that he wrote it. Jason, this is a fascinating book, and and it's an interesting twist on it because so many of us are fans, and you're like, well, this guy was just a one in a generation. He just... There it is. And you're like, but um, but he that, that, that he was influenced, that these ideas were um, synthesized from other sources is it opens up whole new worlds. So wh- what does it mean that he's a medievalist? And, and I wonder if you could just kind of dig in a little deeper on to who are some of these influences that uh, colored his thinking? Yeah. So as a medievalist, I mean, Lewis himself had a kind of a funny definition of the Middle Ages. A scholar might these days say the Middle Ages is roughly the cultural period, which happened from 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D. You could call it pre-modernity. It's before the scientific revolution. It's before the printing press. It's before sort of modern technology. Lewis had a little bit of a funny definition. He said, I think you could go all the way back almost to to Gilgamesh. Right. I mean, like 2000 B.C. And you could go all the way up to more or less 1800 AD. And he said something crazy in his Cambridge inaugural address that he thinks that someone living in early 1800, like Jane Austen, had more in common with Egyptian pharaohs than Jane Austen does with people (laughs) of his generation. Right. So people who separated by two millennia have more in common than people separated by a single century. And he thought that basically the the way that they felt about the world, the way they felt about human flourishing, the way they, I mean, and some kind of some deep stuff here, but the way they felt about time and space and the way that they felt the presence of, of God and prayerfulness, as opposed to our modern scientific, you know, scientific age in which we have individual say, academic departments to pursue all these things. We live, he says, in a fragmented age, but also a machine age 
in which, as one writer put it, we envy our grandchildren's grandchildren because then they'll have access to technologies that we don't. Whereas our ancestors lived in a holistic age, an integrated age, an age which made sense and was rooted, and they envied their ancestors because they lived closer to the golden age when people mm-hmm. were had full hearts and were uh, sort of you know closer to depth and integration. So, and if you start stacking up all these little things, um, that's what Lewis called the great divide which separated our ancestors from those of us who live in a machine, technological, and as he also calls it, a government pushing advertising propagandistic age. Mm -hmm. Boy, does that ring true. And if that, to those who are watching and listening, if that doesn't ring true to you, (laughs) excuse me, it's not COVID, it's my pipe. (laughs) Uh, Turn it. (laughs) Turn off your radio because you're not going to like what follows or, or turn off your computer and quit watching. Kathy? Jason, um, I sort of had two questions, but um, if you could. Um, a term, I can't even imagine the amount of research that went into that went into this book. If Steve is 40 saying, years, yeah, I, I started at zero <laughs> learning English. There you go. Yeah. Steve, as Steve said, you know, and he really is somebody who who has spent his life, you know, reading about Lewis. And if he's finding out all kinds of new stuff, then for you as the author, I'm sure that it was just an amazing trip. Um were there a couple of things, like one or two things that you, that you learned that were um, very surprising, surprising to you about Lewis? And then just on a personal note, I want to know which of his books was your favorite. Oh, wow. Good question. Yeah, great. Yeah, I think. He's got this great essay, which uh, which Steve knows because <laughs> Steve Steve has read it all. Um, he he's got this great essay called "Meditations in a Toolshed," in which he imagines going into a little garage uh, tool shed, and there's a crack in the there's a you know there's a crack in the wood up above, and coming through is a single light beam suspended in dust particles. And Lewis says, when you step in, first of all, you look at this light beam and sort of suspended dust particles in it. Right. But then you can orient yourself and turn your eyes so the light beam falls right on your eye. And now you're looking along the dust beam. Right. You're looking along this. This, In which case, the beam itself disappears. And all you see is the sky behind. That's one of Lewis's favorite metaphors. And it comes up everywhere. Sometimes he uses it in a little bit more technical way. He says it's the difference between contemplation and enjoyment. But more or less, he, it shows up all over the place, looking at and looking along. That was a big surprise to me, that seemingly as a scholar, Lewis read his old languages and looked up his words and dictionaries. And he studied his his dates and his, uh, you know, all these ancient things which could potentially bore you in school. He looked at things as a scholar. And as a as a scholarly writer, as an academic writer, when he gives lectures for his students, he looks at things. But the whole purpose, Lewis always said, of doing this kind of scholarship was to enable people to look along the beam. And this, I think, is exactly what he's doing in his fiction. So this is what surprised me, is how consistent Lewis was in his looking at and looking along. As a scholar, he's doing some heavy lifting. But then as a popular writer, and especially as a fiction writer, he wants to create literary worlds in which he doesn't just say things, but he enables his readers to feel them as true. Enables, I I sometimes say, to feel them in the the pulses, in the veins, right? For Lewis, Christianity and goodness is not just a brain phenomenon in which you have, you know, six correct ideas in your head, but it actually gets into your, your life. You feel it as weighty, as he says, you know, in the weight of glory. That was a really exciting thing for me, uh, for me to discover. Secondly, Lewis didn't feel that he had to invent everything fresh and original. In terms of his composition, he thought he could be medieval, that he could recycle old text. He thought things like Boethius' Constellation of Philosophy, though difficult for us, wasn't out of date if it could just be updated and redeployed. Similarly, sort of with Augustine's Confessions or maybe most of all, Dante's Comedy. All of these things weren't out of date, but they could be rewritten, recycled, made fresh. And so in terms of his composition, um, he could be he didn't have to invent everything new. 
he could just create new imaginary worlds. So sometimes his space journeys are just medieval tales recast into the future. That was exciting to me as well. Oh, um, man. Wow. Oh, this is a great book. You ought to get it. You, uh, you It's not something you want to, you know, just breeze through. You're going to have to dig in and do some thinking. The title of the book, it's Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, How Great Books Shaped a Great Mind. And uh, we live in a culture that desperately needs this kind of book and people like Jason to remind us that the one thought we had yesterday is not as important as we thought it was. Like Jesus, we're going to return. Don't go anywhere. Dr. Jason Baxter. And uh, by the way, you can keep up with him at jasonmbaxter.com. And uh, you'll want to do that after you spend some time with him the way we are. Jason, uh, the time clock rang in our ears. And so I didn't get to find out your favorite of the of uh, C.S. Lewis's books. Yeah, well, I'll say a couple of things which you'll you'll think make me sound like a college professor. I actually, uh, I actually really like his nonfiction. I like his sermons. Um, he wrote this address called the his inaugural address. It's got a fancy Latin title. But when he was made, there's a chair at Cambridge made for him. They they bought him away as a celebrity professor from Oxford. 1954 address. It has a fancy Latin title: De Descriptione Temporum right? Which means a description of historical ages. I love that thing because that's where he ventures to describe what is, uh, how different we live in modernity. And that's where he talks about the living in the machine age and living in the, the sort of the age of government pushed, um, advertising and propaganda. I love that piece. I love his sermon, the weight of glory. I've known that since I was a teenager. Um, and I, I, I've t- probably taught that to every single class of my students, and I love his sermon transposition because I think it's such a it's such a beautiful idea of heavenly realities trying to get into our earthly temporal realities and trying to translate themselves, or as he says, engage in a transliteration or a transposition. And he uses this cool image of in an age before electronic recording. Right. Imagine a symphony, a, a, you know, a big symphony with all kinds of instruments, but you can't just record it on a on a, a CD or an MP3 or a record. Well, you write a piano transcription for it. That's Lewis's sort of beautiful image of when we're on our best behavior. And it, there seems to be a kind of weightiness to that experience, which is seems to mean more than it could just for them uh, from a bottom up explanation. So I love that sermon from uh, Lewis and the transposition in terms of his fiction. I kind of go back and forth. I've loved till we have faces, um, especially when the, the whole scene of conversion and revelation and this moment in which you have to, this is hard for us, not just love God, but then let yourself be loved by God. And Lewis describes it as this extraordinary moment of unveiling, right? Where Oral has to take off the veil and let her see her, you know, let herself be seen in all her warts and ugliness and failures and just allow herself to be loved as she is. Weirdly, letting yourself be loved, I think Lewis was very attentive to this, very astute, can be harder than than loving, right? You know, because as a as a good Christian, I can force myself to love the the sort of people who, <laughs> whether they deserve it or not, right? I can put my will into gear, but then to turn around and let yourself be loved, that's a little more frightening um, for some strange reason. So I love that, but I also love uh, Lewis's that hideous strength, 
Um, I love the idea. It's a very, you know, as a very a sentiment of Psalm 2 of those who would wish to displace God, ultimately being fooled and destroyed in their own devices. Uh, I think that is comforting. Um, but also just the unlikely story that a bunch of guys who sit around and read medieval literature will come to save the world. So I, I like I like that hideous string. I wish I could be on the team. <laughs> yeah, well, I like his children's stories, so that'll let you know where I come from. <laughs> his children's stories are deep. Yeah. I'm By the way, the hideous the strength is probably, you know, people say that's the worst of the three uh, science fiction books. And. Uh, I've always loved Hideous Strength better than any of the others. It was a wonderful book. Well, you and I are going to set the world right. Well, we're right. They're wrong. <laughs> they just need to deal with that. Exactly. George? Yeah. 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 Uh, Jason, and we were talking a little off air, too, but you had referenced earlier uh, in the conversation that, um, you know, and in one sense, and, and we're going to probably run out of time, so we'll carry it over, but in one sense, uh, the medieval time period could be considered to cover maybe thousands of years. I mean, uh, your your reference to, you know, person in the late 1800s have less in common with the early 1800s than uh, the early 1800s might have with uh, an Egyptian pharaoh, for example. But trying to narrow that down a little, is there a particular part of that time and uh, and maybe represented by a particular author uh, that uh, C.S. Lewis seemed to be drawn to or especially influenced by? Yes. I think if you have to narrow it down to one, I think you have to say Dante. Um, and I, Don, Lewis himself said some funny things about Dante. He said, I think Dante's poetry, the greatest of all poetry I have read. And yet when it's at its highest pitch of excellence, I hardly feel that Dante had much to do. Um, it's a funny thing to say, but, you know, Lewis seems to think that Dante is like a, you know, an author who just went up at the top of a hill and pressed a big rock and caused it to bump down. And that was his poetry. But I think it's Dante, who more than anyone else represents for Lewis, the high of the medieval. Put your finger right there in that sentence and we'll finish the sentence on the other side of the break. Uh, we're glad you're with us and you're gonna like this book, especially if you like C.S. Lewis. It's called The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis, how great books shaped a great mind. If you like modern day stuff, you might ought to dip your finger into some things that are very old, very true, and very profound. Don't go away, we're coming back. Jason Baxter in this book is the medieval mind of C.S. Lewis. And if you didn't know, by the way, you can watch the show on our Key Life YouTube channel. We're now approaching 7,000 subscribers, which means nothing to me and everything to Matthew. <laughs> Visit YouTube.com Key Life Network. Uh, Jason, uh, George, you want to bring us up to yeah. speed? Uh, Jason, you were talking about uh, one of, if not the uh, favorite author of uh, C.S. Lewis as Dante, and you were talking some about those relationships. And in our conversation off air, uh, you were relating to Gothic cathedrals and his writing Weight of Glory. Can you kind of put those together for us and continue your thought? 
Absolutely. Yeah, so Dante is writing in the 1300s. He's considered toward the end of the Middle Ages. <clears throat> and he's unusually, we were talking earlier about that, the seven, holding 17 truths in mind. Well, Dante probably holds 37 truths in mind. He's, uh, he's, he's writing in a period in which people talk about people writing summas or these, these big manuals in which they want to be faithful to everything that was truly said from the time of Virgil all the way up into the, the previous century. And so Dante takes all of this, but then he does something amazing. He translates it into a world. He translates it into fiction. He translates it into, to go back to one of our other terms, a looking along the beam. And I think for this reason, Lewis just loved Dante. And in a way, Dante created for poetry what medieval builders had created as cathedrals. You go into an old medieval cathedral, say in France or in England, something like Salisbury, and Lewis frequently mentions these in his writing. If you highlight every time he mentions a Gothic cathedral, you'll have quite a collection of instances. And he loved them in part because they're built over several hundred years. They're built with different types of architectures, different types of shapes. You know, they, they, they soar to the ceiling. They have colored, colored glass and all kinds of stone. They're such works of complicated, you know, multi-varied works of, but then they also create this sense of uplift and soaring. You could say a sense of density, or maybe to use one of Lewis's favorite terms, a sense of weight. Lewis loved these things because I think he thought they made heavenly glory seem, seem, seem weighty and meaningful. And why was this such a big deal to Lewis? Well, as he put it in one of his essays, Transposition, he thinks that in one of the characteristics of modernity is that our present notion of the beatific vision cannot outweigh our present notion of the earthly goods we love. We love, and here's how he puts it. The negatives have, so to speak, an unfair advantage in every competition with the positive. In other words, when we think about heavenly glory, we have these really watery, shallow images of maybe some angels playing in white robes on, you know, badly formed guitars, right? Who wants to go there? You know, and you hear this sort of in pop culture, right? Like, I'd rather go surfing in hell with my friends than, than be in a heaven as boring as that. And if that's what heaven is, yeah, I agree. <laughs> so I think what, what Lewis thought that Dante did was create a kind of poetry which made holiness feel weighty, which made our love for neighbors not feel this abstract thing or our love for God, but it took on a kind of gravity, a kind of density in which we have the rare opportunity as moderns in which we feel like our own life is less weighty and less shallow with respect to the heavenly glory. That's why, that's what I argue in my chapter, why Lewis loved Dante. That's how got him on the number one author list. Mm -hmm. You've written a book on mysticism, and there's a chapter in this book there, too. Uh, talk to us. What happens when we go into a cathedral or listen to a symphony and relate that to joy and mysticism in five words? <laughs> <laughs> That should be easy. Yeah. yeah, you know, problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Mysticism in five words. Um, yeah. More like five days. Right. Ironically, yeah. you have to talk a lot about the what is unsayable. Um, yeah. So throughout his life, Lewis has these exceptional moments. If you think maybe, say, at the end of Four Loves, where Lewis finally gets to talking about the love of God. And he gives a paragraph. And it's so beautiful. You wish that he'd keep talking for another 14 pages. But then he very sort of quickly moves away from it. I think Lewis is a little, he's a little shy about mysticism. He's a little shy about um, this, this knowledge of God that I have in the depths of my heart. Because I think Lewis thinks that, well, as he jokingly says in Weight of Glory, that, you know, every, after every Sunday, there's a Monday morning. And that's when you have to return to being an ordinary Christian and not flipping people off as you as you drive around <laughs> on your interstates. And you have to love your neighbor and you have to do your daily devotions and you have to um, you have to do these kind of lower level Christian tasks. And we'd all rather skip to the good stuff. We'd all rather skip to the deep stuff. And so Lewis is a little bit shy about it. And he frequently, I think, sort of warns his readers off these kinds of mystical depths. And yet... There are enough moments throughout his writing, especially when he talks about Lucy, because Lucy is the great mystic. 
right? Lucy is the one whose capacity for love is greater, I think, than, than any other character. And Lewis sort of borrows some of his, some of his readings of, of the medieval world and attributes them to Lucy. So what is mysticism? Uh, mysticism is the love of God in the depth of my own heart, such that I realize that Christianity is not primarily being good. This is what always sort of uh, you know, boggles the minds of my students. Christianity is not a code of ethics. Christianity is not avoiding bad behaviors. Christianity is a kind of love and a kind of freedom and a kind of vision of the depths and beauty of God, out of which all of my choices for goodness eventually flow. The mystic holds that the love of God is weightier than any other thing. And there are some very beautiful, if brief moments in Lewis in which we could see some of his medieval learning about mysticism coming into his fiction or his nonfiction. Mm. Mm. Oh man, you know, we're running out of time and uh, Jason, we could spend hours and hours with you. And uh, if you're smart, you'll get this book, the medieval mind of CS Lewis, and you can spend some of those hours with Jason and then if he will, we'll have him back and talk about some other things that are just as profound. Jason, we got 15 seconds. You got a final word? Well, when you live in Wyoming, you always want friends in California and friends in Florida. So, yeah, <laughs> this, is, this has been an incredible pleasure. I've had a lot of fun. And this is, like I said, this team is way too rowdy for me. <laughs> yeah, sure. In fact, we're conservative compared to you. Jason, you're a delight. Thanks for being with us. And Thanks by so the much. way, the name of the book is The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis. How great books shaped a great mind. If there ever was a good time to read this book, it's our time. Even more than C.S. Lewis time, we're worse. And somebody's got to write this book, and Jason did. Jason, thanks for being with us. God bless you. We rise up and call you blessed. Thank you. Hey, we're going to come back and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. <laughs> and you're going to be amazed. last part I sum up and preach kind of a sermonette for Christianettes kind of thing. <laughs> but, you know, we're living in a tough time and I don't know about you, but I've been, uh, I've been watching all this stuff on the Ukraine and uh, it absolutely has blown me away. It's like acid and you just go, Oh man, our pastor is a, uh, been to the Ukraine a lot and uh, is very connected with friends who are Christians and serving in the Ukraine. We took up an offering uh, for them in our worship services yesterday. So I just want to make sure that you're praying uh, for the people there, but that you're also um, um uh, praying for your brothers and sisters there. Um, these kinds of tragedies are awful. And we all wince as we watch on television these courageous people who are standing. But don't forget your family. They're there. And they have an incredible opportunity to bring a witness of Christ uh, in the middle of a very tragic and and scary times. So pray for them and pray for the Ukraine and uh, let's hold on to our suits, uh, seats and pray that 
Putin has an attack of sanity and puts his nuclear weapons away because that could be a time that would be crisis for all of us. Well, enough about that, but don't forget, okay? Kathy, who's going to be on next week? Next week, our friend Jessica Thompson's going to be back with us. She's It's been a while since she's been with us She because uh, it's been a while since she's written a book, and, and she does have a new one out. It's called How God Loves Us, and it's um, kind of like a devotional kind of book, 40 Days to Discovering his character in the fruit of the spirit. So she's going through all of the, uh, you know, all the fruit of the spirit. And, and I think it'll, I think it'll be great. She's a, Jess is a good writer and, and we like her. Yeah. She's a fun guest to have. So that, that ought to be a little bit religious, but <laughs> listen, that's what, that's our business. I mean, if you want secular commentary on secular things, go somewhere else. But I would prefer you didn't, because here is the place where mystics reside. A place of quietness, profound thoughts, cathedrals, and symphonies. Uh, We're going to come back next week. (laughs) Same time, same place. Hope you join us. And between now and then... Don't do anything we wouldn't, and that gives you a wide, wide berth. <laughs>